The following interview was conducted with Robert W. Topping for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, May 8, 2008 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian, also sitting in as his wife. Welcome and good morning. Um, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born here in Lafayette, West Lafayette, and my dad was on the faculty. Okay. What In what department? Double A, Electrical Engineering. And uh, I went to school here. Where'd you go to grade school? Grade school at Morton School, okay. which is now a uh, community center of some okay. sort. And uh, I was there not too long ago. It looks just like it did when I was a student there, okay. except for the teachers. And uh, whereabouts did you live in West? Did you live in West Lafayette? West Lafayette and lived on Robinson Street. Okay. Uh, as an aside, I think my dad bought that house in 1911 for $3,000. And it recently, somebody remodeled it and it recently sold for 400000 Wow. It was a big, big yard. Yeah, big yard. And, uh, you have any siblings, brothers, or sisters? Oh, yes. I have uh, I had three half brothers. And then my own brother and two sisters. And I was the youngest of all seven. Okay, okay. Uh, born in 1925. Okay. Tell us a little bit about high school. You say you went to West Side? I went to West Side High School and uh, barely got out of there. <laughs> Too and, many uh, activities? Were you involved uh, at all see, in, in the I publications played, or writing at all when you were in high no, school? No, I didn't at all. Uh, I played football badly. How'd the team do? Well, when I played there, they were pretty good. Okay. And it's a good thing they didn't let me play. Why? I was just a scrub. <laughs> and... Uh, I got hit in the head once, and the doctor told me I shouldn't play anymore, so I didn't. <laughs> and let's see. You could walk to school then, couldn't you? I had to walk to school. We walked home for lunch. Okay. That's a long way yeah. from uh, up on uh, Grant Street, clear down to Robinson and back. Sure. It was a long walk. I finally got a job washing dishes at the cafeteria. So I ate my lunch at uh, the West Side Cafeteria. Okay. Okay. And then after high school, did you decide to come to Purdue? Well, I went to the service. Oh, okay. And... Uh, what branch were you in and where did... I was in the Air Force. Okay. For about uh, 27 months. Nobody was happier than I was when the war ended. And uh, then I went to Purdue on the GI Bill. Probably would have gone here anyway, but I went to school on the GI Bill and uh, graduated in 1950. Okay. Tell us a little bit about campus life when you were here. Did you live on campus or lived at home? No, I lived at home. And uh, there were plenty of times that I wished I'd lived in Cary Hall or one of the other residences. Uh, it was an exciting time. I, I, I became interested in journalism at Purdue. And I probably sh should have gone to IU or Butler or someplace else. But uh, I went, finished Purdue, majored in English, and uh, had a good time. I was editor of the so called humor magazine. Is it uh, still being? The river? Oh, okay, okay. I think it's defunct now. Okay. Most of the publications I had something to do with are now defunct. <laughs> <laughs> they had a Scrivener magazine, which was supposed to be more of a literary magazine, and it was it was it was a good little magazine, but it, it's too not defunct. And uh, were you in any other student clubs or? Uh, well, let's see. Sigma Delta Chi. Okay. 
which was a journalism monterey. Right. And uh, I think that was about the extent of my okay. years at Purdue. When, what year did you graduate? 1950. Okay. In February. Okay. They had three commencements that year. 1950 they did? Yeah, they had one in uh, February, one in June, and one in August. And they had to have that many because there were so many students at the university that uh, before the war ended, Purdue had about, uh, well, uh, before the war, had about 6,000 students or so. Then uh, they trained a lot of V-12 and Army ASTP students during the war. Then after the war, they were suddenly flooded with 13,000 students. And if you didn't have a, you, you could not be admitted if you didn't have a place to live. And I know there were a lot of guys who lived in their cars and they put down the address, whatever house they parked in front of. <laughs> as their, their That was their home, the car? As their home. My goodness. Didn't they build some, uh, some temporary buildings after the war, though? They built a lot of, they, they hauled in a lot of uh, old warehouse buildings from Bunker Hill Air Force Base over near uh, Peru. Howdy was the new president. He had his work cut out for him. Um, what was the uh, village like? What was Chauncey Village like during the time you were here? About the same as it is now. Okay. Except there was a pool hall down there. I don't think that exists anymore. So, yeah. But that attracted a lot of the male population. <laughs> and uh, A lot of the activities, social events, were in the Union? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, they had... Uh, Four o'clock dances every afternoon. Wow. Oh, and uh, the ballrooms, I remember when they built the North Ballroom, on, uh, they added on to the Union building. And uh, they had a lot of dances. There were the military ball, the junior prom. Uh, I can't name them all. Probably a senior prom, too. Could be. Sure. My sisters went to all those dances, and uh, they they were uh, they were was quite popular. Fowler Hall was still was that had that been torn down when you came? Or no, it was still here. It was still here. Okay, and it was built. I think I don't know when it was built. Right, but uh, uh, it was too small, even when the university was. They had 6,000 students. It was too small for commencements. And they had the commencements in the armory at that time. And uh, Elliot wanted so badly to have that music hall built so they could have a commencement there. And they still do, I guess. And uh, it was fitting that they named it for him. Right. He worked so hard, and they built that building uh, with federal funds for about a million dollars. You couldn't touch that for a million dollars today. <clears throat> and at the time, I think it was almost as big as Radio City Music Hall or bigger, I don't know what was. There's quite a, a rivalry contest, seat oh, wise yeah. back and forth, you hear about that. And uh, the campus looks a lot different. I retired in, uh, from the staff in 1990. And I don't recognize the, all the buildings that's been done just since then that's right. on, the, on the Purdue campus. That's right. yeah. uh, President Jiski was responsible for a lot of new buildings, I guess. That's right. Such and, as Discovery uh, Park. Pardon? Discovery Park. Discovery Park, that's right. Right, okay. okay. He did a lot there. And uh, at the time Hovde was president, when I went to school, uh, 
they thought that he had done a lot for the campus with new buildings and so on. And he did, but nothing like what has happened in the last few years. All right, all right, okay. And so then you, oh, you graduated when, what uh, year did you graduate? I graduated in 1950. Okay. And I got a job on a weekly newspaper at Oxford, which is now defunct. And uh, Where was the newspaper? In Indiana? Oxford, Indiana. Okay. And uh, I did all our proofreading. It was more of a printing plant than it was a newspaper. The guy that owned it put out a newspaper kind of as a service to the community, and he needed somebody to edit it. And uh, at the time, we printed our magazine, so he said, as soon as you graduate, you can kind of work for me, and you can edit the paper and uh, be proofreader for the plant, which I did. And then I got recalled to the service during the Korean War. And I did uh, Air Force Public Relations for a year, which was lucky. And uh, afterwards, I got a job as a reporter on the Laporte Herald Argus, Laporte, Indiana. And then I went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, at the Grand Rapids Press for about six years. Then I came back to Purdue. How did you happen to come to Purdue? Did they, uh, was well, Tommy open? Johnson was head of the Bureau of Information at the time, and he was an old family friend. And uh, he asked me if I was interested. Well, I really wasn't. The more I thought about it, though, the more I considered that it would be a good place for the kids. I had four kids. So we came back to Purdue, and uh, I had a daughter graduating in nursing, and a son who graduated from Purdue. Mm -hmm. Did your 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 family? Did you meet your wife at Purdue? No, she went to uh, Manchester College. Okay. Uh, let's see, I had. Harold graduated from Purdue. He was one of my half brothers. Fred went to Purdue for a couple of years, but he was kind of a stubborn sort, and he didn't want to go through commencement, so he quit. And he got a job in the sports editor of the Journal Courier. He was the first sports editor, and all the sports editor did in those days was pick up the scores of the games that were played around the community. And uh, Harold got his degree in mechanical engineering. My brother got two degrees. He got a Bachelor of Science. And then he went a little longer and got a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. And two sisters got degrees in uh, Home Economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a degree in Bachelor of Science. Okay with a major in English. So it's quite a Purdue family that uh, went all into Purdue. Pretty much. Oh. Dad taught here 46 years. Hmm. Came here in 1903, and you can imagine what the campus looked like then. It was pretty much a desert. <laughs> and there was a double E building. It was built on the, uh, I think it would be the northwest corner, over by the, uh, Lions, near there. And uh, later that became something else. And they built the present double E building on Northwestern Avenue. I was probably the bane of my father's life for not going into engineering, but I just couldn't. Cut the math. <laughs> I was a terrible mathematician. That was a challenge. That's a challenge. I still am. <laughs> oh yes, but he didn't care. He just, just so we got a college education. It was his main concern. And uh, 
five of his seven did. Okay. Um, now you, uh, let's go back then. So you, now you've come to Purdue. Yeah, I came to Purdue in 1962. Okay. As a member of, Tommy Johnson was the head of the Bureau of Information. Tell the researchers what the Bureau of Information, what did that entail? The Bureau of Information was the, like the news service at that time. And uh, he needed, he wanted to expand that a little bit because the university was getting larger. And uh, so I came here from Grand Rapids Press and Dick Smith, who had been a reporter for the Fort Wayne News Sentinel, coming down here about a year before that, I did. And uh, we were the two newest members of the staff, which meant that he had a staff of four people. Now they have a large, I don't know how big a staff they have, they must have a dozen people writing reviews. Mm -hmm. Gene Norberg is the head of the new service. <coughs> right. Where were you located? Where was the uh, office located? We are in South Texas. Well, when I first came back to Purdue, we were located on the third floor of the hall. Mm, okay. And uh, then uh, to show the great esteem with which the administration held us at the time, we were moved down to the South Campus Courts, which had been the uh, dormitories for men graduate students. And uh, they were built by National Homes. And, uh, They acted that way. They were full of termites for some reason. Oh dear. Not a good location. <laughs> not, not the best. As a matter of fact, we took our news releases and we put them in bound volumes just for reference. And one day I heard a loud scream come and it was one of our secretaries had pulled one of the things out and opened it up and there was, all the pages were eaten by termites. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Oh, <laughs> that that Bureau of Information uh, was renamed the Purdue News Service. Yeah, when uh, then you became Tommy the director. retired. Yeah, and they hired uh, a man from uh, Illinois, Herb Schaller. I think he's gone now too, uh, as head of the News Service, and he reorganized it into into the News Service from the old Bureau of Information. Okay. And he hired some more people. Uh, so we had a rather flourishing department for a while. You were the director of the, the news service then? Well, the University News. What, after, you, tell us a little bit about your responsibilities Herb, in office. Herb was, uh, during the uh, so-called unrest years. Herb spent most of his time in the executive building conferring with the president and his staff. So he left the news service in, in, in charge, in my charge. And uh, subsequently I became director of the news service. Okay. What that were way. some of the responsibilities and the challenges in there? Tell us a little bit about what that entailed that position? Well, it kept me from getting an afternoon nap. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Did you, were you issued some of the publications so, uh, such as, you know, Perspective? You started Perspective then. We uh, started a Perspective Gosh, I forget the year. Uh, probably 1976. 1970. Pardon? 1976. Yeah, that was the first issue. And uh, Lynn Doyle was our editorial assistant. But she was so good at what she did that uh, she actually was managing editor. So she was really in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of that publication. And uh, 
I checked the stories that went into it very carefully. And uh, they wanted to use a lot of fundraising stories. And I said, you'll turn the alumni off real quick if you start that. Uh, so instead, we pretty well kept the stories about campus life, about the faculty. And we found that a lot of the alumni could, could remember that reminded them of their own professors, mm -hmm. some, some of whom were st still at Purdue. One of the publications, well, did you do Campus Copy? Wasn't that one that was done at one time? Campus Copy was done by the uh, personnel oh, okay. department, pretty much. Okay. And uh, I think we checked it to make sure everything was uh, made sense, okay. grammatically correct, and so on. Right. Uh, what were some of the other publications, some of the other the things? Did you issue some newsletters, or what were some of the things that were involved there? Well, a lot of the, a lot of the publications were started uh, as a result of the so-called unrest years. I think it was in the 60s, pretty much. Uh, I think Newsweek called Purdue a hotbed of rest <laughs> instead of a hotbed of unrest. And uh, we didn't have the problems here that a lot of schools had. Uh, don't ask me why. I don't know why we didn't. Uh, the problems we had were bad enough as I recall, but uh, some of the publications were started as a result of the unrest years, so they weren't of much value afterward mm -hmm. when things settled down. Mm -hmm. uh, what about news releases? Did your office were you responsible for the We news? did all the news releases. Okay, so you worked in conjunction uh, with the administration or the departments? Yeah. And, okay. Pretty right. much. Right. We didn't put out any releases uh, that affected policy unless it had been carefully checked by the president himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't want to be bothered with all, a lot of that detail anyway. But he, he, was, he was willing to look things over. And uh, we never had any problem getting in to see him if we needed to. And uh, I did, I remember his secretary called down to our office one day, and for some reason, nobody answered the phone. He must have rung about six or eight times. And uh, he picked up the phone and she said, so who she was and where she was from. She said, don't you people answer the phone down there? <laughs> Well, I'm very sorry, but for some reason, I didn't get answered. What about the uh, spokesman for the news? Uh, you know, such as uh, did you uh, if press, uh, somebody would call and you or just issue the news releases in print, or or did you have some uh, oral contact with the news people? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, Local and and we national? used to get a lot of calls from the Journal and Courier. And oh, I suppose twice a week from the Indianapolis papers. And uh, they were always fair with us. And uh, we found that if we played fair with them, they played fair with us. And it was a kind of a problem at times because uh, the way stories broke, uh, we'd get accused of favoring one newspaper over another. We tried we tried to uh, avoid that, but it's kind of impossible, depending on uh, when a story is ready to go. All right, and when the release time is and when it's received probably can affect the, the channel of, of when and it's And a sent. lot of times, 
They always had somebody up here to cover the Board of Trustees meetings. Well, the Board of Trustees would, somebody would say something and said, don't print that. Well, I would print it. But <laughs> if a reporter was here from the Indianapolis Star News, he would report it. And then I'd get blamed for it. <laughs> Did you sit in on the Board of Trustees meetings as well? Uh, latter part of my career at Purdue, I guess. Mm -hmm. I uh, covered all the board meetings. Okay. And I wrote stories in advance many times and just held on to them until the action was taken, then I'd hand them to the press. All right, okay, okay, all right. Um, but, uh, but you didn't do Purdue Today, or, or uh, did you do some mentoring of your staff? The people that you, mentoring, did you do mentoring of your staff, people that you hired, work with them pretty closely? Well, let's see. Yeah. Do you have any students that also work down there, too? Lynn Doyle was a student. <coughs> Excuse me. When she started. And uh, did you say mentoring? Mentoring. Mentoring them. Well. To some extent. Most of the people we, we employed were people who had as, as much or more experience than the rest of us did. Okay. So you increased your staff over time? Little by little. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. And uh, I remember once, whether we hired, if we had a diversified staff, and I said, no, we don't. And why is that? Well, I hadn't made any effort. I hired people that are qualified not necessarily because of their skin color. But I said if a good qualified uh, African American came along, I'd hire him. It didn't matter, okay. matter to me what his color was. Right, yeah, okay. Let's talk a little bit about you being an author. Um, one, of the, one of the first books was the, uh, the Hovde Years that you wrote. How did that come about? How did you, that was a start and you've done others, so let's talk a little bit about those. Um, did you have an idea to do the book about Dr. Hubbard? No. John Hicks thought it ought to be written. After he had stepped down, he was no longer the president. Is that correct? You did it after he had stepped down or? No, he was still. Uh, still the president? He was still executive, executive uh, assistant he, uh, to uh, the Hub president. Oh. But President Hovde had stepped down though, had he? He had not? just about ready to. Okay. No, I guess he had to step down because he occupied an office over there for several years after he retired. And I met with him up there. So John Hicks said, I said, well, I'll, I'd will like to try that. He said, okay, it's your assignment. So I started that. What about the uh, responsibilities in the Office of Publications? Did you have that at the same time that you were writing the book? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, that may, that's a full plate there. That's about all I wanted to. <laughs> uh, were you, uh, did you do uh, any inter um, oral interviews with um, Dr. Hovde? Or oh yeah, much? about twice a week. He'd come over to the office, answer his mail and so on. And uh, I'd sit down and talk with him. Okay. And he loaned me a diary he kept when he was uh, United States Liaison Secretary for uh, research. He was in England during the Blitz years. And uh, it was an invaluable diary. I imagine. Oh, yes. Very good. He loaned that to me. And I used that. It was a good source. For a good source. Right. Uh -huh. Did you interview, the, you interviewed the family as well? Oh, yes. Okay. Did you have any travel involved with uh, doing the book or? Yeah. You... Uh, President Hovde, as a boyhood, or during his boyhood, 
lived in North Dakota. His dad was a weatherman. And uh, so one day I hopped aboard a plane and I got way out there in the middle of, where is it, Grand Forks or someplace. And I rented a car and drove the rest of the way to his hometown, which is not a, not a big town, but a very nice little town uh, in North Dakota. And I spent a couple of days there and I talked to a lot of people that remembered him and uh, talked to I talked to his mother. Believe it or not, the man was nearly 70 years old and I talked to his mother and dad. <laughs> We're still living. Well, that was, you were lucky, but that's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> his, his mother and dad were both, and his dad couldn't talk very long because he had three chess games going by phone. <laughs> but uh, I did talk to his mother, and I can see why he was the man that he was after talking to her. <laughs> she was, uh, she was past 90, but uh, she talked like she was still 60, you know. Sounds like an interesting couple. They were. Okay. And he was an interesting man. Yes. Then, uh, what your next book was that the uh, the century and beyond? Yeah, that was history. History. Uh, John Hicks suggested I do that. It had been done since 1925, and uh, by a couple of. History professors. Hepburn didn't was that Hepburn, the Hepburn book? Yeah. And uh, Hepburn a, and uh, Sears. Correct. Had done it. It was a good book. Yes, it's a good source for the early years. Oh yes, I use it. I used it too. Right. <laughs> uh, but John thought the uh, John Hicks suggested that the history be done again, so I did that too. And. Uh, that was probably the highlight of my career at Purdue was doing that book. Did you still have the Office of Publications at the, when you were writing that book? Uh, yeah, but I think the duties of the office had been turned over to somebody else, okay. pretty much. Okay. I so pretty that freed, much freed you up to spend more time on Well, the as a matter of fact, I became a... Uh, senior editor in the Office of Publications, which are two different offices. And uh, so I wrote that book pretty much as a senior editor over the Office of Publications. Okay. Tell us a little bit about uh, what some of your sources. Did, was Purdue did you use a lot of sources here and uh, put getting that book, which is well-researched? Well, let's see. One of the best sources, no, I used that book, was the uh, the American College president, and I can't tell you the author right now. He was all, he was uh, had been he was a retired president of an Eastern school, and it was a good book, and I used that for the for the uh, of the years. But I also used it for the uh, history because they had they, the man had a lot of insights into what makes the college really go. There was oh I used newspaper clippings. I went to one of the best sources was the. Uh, Well, the best, one of the best for, was right here, our own library, but the uh, county library was a good source too. Historical society library, right. Uh, you have quite a lengthy chapter in that book on John Perdue. Um, did you do any traveling at all to get that or was the material you were able to use here? Pretty much right around here. Okay. Uh, 
the best book on John Perdue was written by Bob Crevel. I don't know if you've seen that book or not. He did an excellent job, I think. Midas of the Wabash. Midas of the Wabash. Mm -hmm. And he had, he told me that, well, he said, I used a lot of your stuff in, the, in your book. I did a whole chapter on John Perdue. Yes, you did. And I thought I'd quote him pretty well, but not like uh, Bob did. <laughs> Bob uh, did, a, did an excellent job, I thought. Uh -huh. And uh, what about some interviews of people? Did you do any traveling about interviewing some people for the book on the century and beyond? Oh, any boy. comments on that? My memory is kind what of about some of the president? You interviewed John John Hicks probably was a source or Dr. Well, Anderson? yeah, he was. Okay. He was very helpful. Uh, a lot of letters, people somehow knew that I was doing it, and I got letters from alumni, older alumni, and my own dad. Uh, unfortunately, mother and dad had passed away before they had a chance to see any of the books I'd done, uh -huh. and uh, I've always kind of regretted that. They probably didn't think I could do it. <laughs> they would have appreciated it. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, um, when you did the interviewing, did you do any uh, um, oral interviews at all, or just did you make notes when you talked to some of the people for this book? A little of both. Okay. Okay. I made some notes, especially. <coughs> Especially when I interviewed by phone, okay. and uh, which I found not as satisfactory as sitting down with the person. Sure, right. Where was you have some good pictures in there? What did where did you get pictures from people? Those pictures, no, those pictures were all on file around the university someplace, and uh, I think. Egg information, last I heard, had possession of all those pictures and they needed somebody to go through them with them, to sort them out. And I'd like to do that sometime, but uh, I haven't had enough. But there's a lot of pictures. I remember that one of the deans over in the School of Consumer Family Scientists wanted to throw away a lot of old pictures that showed home economic students cooking. She said, they don't do that anymore. Throw those away. I said, no, we don't throw anything away. Uh, first of all, they're the, the pictures that belong to the university, not to me personally. So I don't throw them away. But she said, well, we don't ever use those. And I said, oh, well, we don't. We're not going to use those pictures. But somebody writing a history of the school and things that, and student life well, at, that yeah, time, that, that, at that time. You know. be, sure, right. They should be saved. Right, exactly. <clears throat> then the, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the Book of the Trustees. You wrote that, too. Well. How did that come about? There had been a book uh, written years before on people who were trustees. Two things, it needed to be brought up to date. Uh, secondly, it needed to be shortened. Because they had... Uh, Was the previous book long? Yeah. Oh, okay. About that thick. And uh, Tommy Johnson and Helen Hand, who at the time, had, a long time ago, had been secretary to the Board of Trustees wrote that thing. And they wrote too much, I thought. So we shortened up a lot of the old biographies and then we brought it up to date at that time. It needs to be done again. Right. Been a lot of changes since then. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
just since I don't even remember the date that was published. Well, maybe 89, 90, something like that. So since then there's been quite a few changes. Uh, all right, okay. Um, you, were, uh, you were lucky to be able to get pictures that uh, are in the book. Oh, yeah. That, en that enhances the text, I think, having the picture. Oh, yeah, that does. Right, but I suppose if a person looked at it and said, did I look like that in that picture? <laughs> People change. Did I look like that in that picture? Because people change, you know. Oh, but sure. It's very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, now the next thing is on the Lafayette Leader, topping at large. Tell us, you did some articles for the Lafayette Leader. Well, for researchers, is a local paper here. I think I did a couple of articles, but mostly I did a tried to do a column, which wasn't very successful. Uh, I can't say really that I was proud of what I did. What that, would the column be about? Local activities? Just junk, pretty much. Okay. Thoughts from... Or on various topics? Yeah. Okay. Right. Wasn't very good. Okay. You did that for a while then, right? I um, did that uh, for a while after I retired. After, uh, when you retired then, did you, uh, you stayed out in the community? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, we moved, uh, Sue and I moved to uh, Florida about 1993. Okay. And uh, we decided that wasn't for us, so we came back. Now, Sue's from, originally from Wisconsin, and I'm not sure that... Uh, the Hoosier State uh, is all in her favor, uh, especially the past spring, which has been cold. I said, what are you complaining about? Cold in Indiana for? Wisconsin a lot colder than Indiana. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, the, uh, you clarify for the research what Purdue Studies was and the Purdue Press. That was a... Uh, well, Purdue Studies was the Purdue Press, and uh, I think at the time for university public uh, university books, yeah, authored by only Purdue people or uh, people from the outside. Uh, I think some. I think there was some books, good books, that were done by people outside of the. Uh, so it was like, a un was like the University Press, in other words. And then later they changed the name from Purdue Studies to Purdue Press. And John Hicks said, we don't have a press. And I said, no, <laughs> that's a, a name that they have given to the publishing house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the Noel book on history of engineering, when you look in the imprint there, that's Purdue Studies. The Noel book right. in there. Right. And that was a good book. It's it's very helpful. It's a good reference. Bud know. Noel was going to do another book during did you our... Know, did you know him? Oh, yes. Okay. He was on the English staff. I didn't have him for class, but I got to know him. And uh, he was going to do another book during the centennial year. In but somehow it never got done. Uh, I think it was a matter of financing. Okay, okay. More than anything. Yeah. The Centennial, there were quite a few things that came out during that year, weren't there? They had little separate yeah. publications and things. Were you involved in any of those at all or, or not? In any of those publications that came out in the Centennial year? Not really. I may have contributed contributed a, something to them, but I... Sure, right. Okay. That's right. Let's talk a little bit about some of your awards. One of the ones that you got, your Sagamore of the Wabash. Yeah. Yeah. How, tell us how that came about. Did you know in I, advance? I was more, pretty much surprised. Joe Bennett, who just recently retired, they had a dinner for a retirement dinner for me out at the trails, and uh, 
during the meeting, or they were presenting me with this, that, and the other thing. Joe stands up with this thing, uh, Sagamore of the Wabash, which I've always been very proud of. And uh, I think I think that was pretty much initiated by Joe through the governor's office. <laughs> it's a very nice award. Yeah, very nice. You have your you have it hung up at home. Oh yes. Okay, that's very nice. Yeah. And uh, I got the uh, a book award for the after years from the. Uh, Oh boy. The Valley Forge Why can't I think of that? And that's an association with Valley Forge yeah. or Press or well very good. I got that award. And also I didn't you get the leather medal award for uh, Oh yes, I got the leather medal. Uh I remember a story about that. One of the, yeah, what is, is it really, is the metal really leather? Yeah, they had uh, a thing hung in the Union building, saying one of those four, and then they had the strips of people over the years that had won it. And uh, Sigma Della Chi gave that award for the best teacher award and the leather medal, and the leather medal was for those who had contributed to the best public relations of the year, and I guess they thought the book, uh, the of years, or I mean the uh, uh, century and beyond, was uh, the reason for that. And uh, I remember a guy at the office, I got the phone call and said, you won the leather medal. And he said, I said, why don't I, and I made the comment after I hung up, why don't I ever get an award to have gold or silver or something I can pawn? <laughs> he said, look at it this way, Topping. It could have been nog hide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one earlier award that uh, I was able to find out that you got from the American Political Science Association for Distinguished Reporting of State oh, yeah. and Local Government. That's kind of nice. Uh, that must have been when you were working for the newspaper. I worked, I got that when I worked on the the Port Herald Argus. Uh, I wrote a series about eight stories on the uh, way that poor relief is administered in this state by the township trustees, which is not good to have an elected official in charge of doling out the doles. And uh, that's the way it has been in this state. I wrote uh, a series of eight stories on that. I guess that's why that award came. And uh, I wrote a, a series, I think two, two or three stories on the old Indiana poll tax and uh, pointing out that it, it picked out men between the ages of 21 in 35, paid a poll tax every year in the state. And that uh, series was somebody, I think it was the legislator from Laporte County had that put, had those series of stories entered into the minutes of the, of the uh, legislative meetings. As a result of that, Apparently, uh, news to me, later they passed a bill uh, dropping that tax. It's the first time that I know of that a legislature 
has actually reduced the tax. <laughs> right. And they did that time. They uh, eliminated that. What about the the, uh, the Dole thing? Did that change over time from the trust? Uh, any? What was the outcome of that? The uh, articles that you wrote about the trustees or the uh, the township trustees handled the doles and things. Did that change over time? No. Oh, okay. Still do that same okay. way. And I found out later that uh, the trustee lobbyists in the state legislature are a fairly formidable group. You, <laughs> you better have a good reason for wanting to change things before you mess around with that. I'd like to, but I'm getting a little old for that now. <laughs> uh, you part have you participated in the alumni being a Purdue grad? you participate in the Alumni Association at all? Not really. Okay. Uh, we're members, mm -hmm. but uh, no, I haven't okay. been involved in it. You know, the class of 1950, that uh, the class of building, you were involved well, in Well, we that. were involved in that, yes. Uh -huh. We raised uh, money for our class members for that, which were matched by an equal amount from President Beering to build that building over there. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing they did. I had a class in the old building that they tore down to build that, and uh, it was a fire trap. If that thing had ever caught a fire while there was classes in there, they'd have burned up three or, three or 400 people. <laughs> Mm. It was an old building, I remember that. Oh, it was old. Excuse me. Okay. Um, your favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Well, I think earlier I mentioned that it used to be that fraternities, sororities, and the uh, other housing units used to put up decorations for homecoming. And as a kid, we used took our bicycles and rode all around West Lafayette and looked at all the decorations, which were pretty fantastic. I remember at the Kappa Sigma house, they had a waterfall coming out of the third story window, clear down to the ground, plump back up again. And they said, the sign said, Wisconsin Falls. And it was kind of spectacular to see that much water coming out of the top story of the fraternity house. <laughs> but there were there were a lot of very clever decorations. They don't seem to do that much no, anymore. So. No, they don't. Right. Uh, and the last thing about an outstanding event in your life does that come any come to mind for you? Oh boy. As you look back on your not, years? Not really. Okay. A retirement. <laughs> and it's nice, to, and you enjoy coming back to the community? And you have oh, family I, here? Oh, I did. Mm -hmm. Very much. All right. And you have family here, and things of that sort. Okay. Well, I think this concludes it, and I want to Mother thank and Andrew are still there. Yeah. I, well, I hope this has been valuable for I you. Conclude, yes, I, we want to thank you very much, Dr. Mr. Topping. Very my, nice. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.